Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to present to you our work on how we use uh, biomolecules to enhance the durability of concrete. I see a lot of people from University of Miami. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, OK. Let me start by introducing our lab, uh, Advanced Infrastructure Materials uh, Research Laboratory at the University of Miami, where we work on uh, bio-inspired ways to increase the durability of concrete. Uh, my lab mates and the undergraduate uh, assistants that helped in this project. Uh, I'm Sadek Taleh. I'm doing my PhD in the College of Engineering. You can scan that code if you want to connect on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to talk to you after the session. Uh, uh, my research is mostly uh, focused on bio-inspired ways uh, or bio-inspired uh, chemicals to increase the durability of concrete. OK, let me start with the problem at, at hand. You probably have noticed uh, sites like this, especially in Boston, where it gets really cold. So basically, this is the freestyle action, where uh, it is a very big uh, problem throughout the world, and especially in US, where we have very uh, high perspiration and uh, low temperatures. Um, and this causes costs a lot of uh, money in repair annually. Uh, basically, water gets into concrete. When it freezes, it expands. It puts some pressure on the concrete microstructure and causes it to crack. Uh, around 60 to 80 years ago, people figured out if you add some uh, air voids, usually between 4 to 7 percent, uh, small pockets of air uh, well dispersed, it would uh, really increase the durability of concrete to orders of uh, magnitude in cycles. Um, and people have been using different uh, chemicals to, for that. What we uh, are working on are uh, to use biomolecules as admixtures, in this case, specifically air and training admixtures. Uh, they have a lot of benefits. Some of them are that they're green. Uh, they're green means meaning that they're sustainable, they're biodegradable, they have very complex and specific functionalities that can be helpful. One of the properties that they have is condition sensitivity, which is that they are very uh, sensitive to different conditions. So proteins usually are in a coiled structure that is called native state. This is the picture that you see on the left, on the bottom. Uh, different conditions like temperature, pH, and chemicals can cause proteins to uncoil or unfold. And because of this change in 3D structure that happens in the nanoscale, a lot of the properties change. And these properties can significantly, significantly change the effect they have on uh, different materials, especially our body. That's why, for example, the egg uh, that you put in a pan on high temperature changes shape. Uh, basically, the chemical structure of those proteins are changing. And a lot of food or food science is basically trying to uh, change these structures. Um, this is a schematic of our entire project where, where we take these biomolecules. In this uh, talk, I'm talking about only proteins. We take these proteins, uh, we look at their molecular uh, scale properties, like uh, hydrophobicity, volume, and other stuff. Uh, we test these properties in the solution, which would be the physiochemical properties, things like self-extension, absorption, to different isotherms, uh, to the different interfaces, and their repulsive forces. And at the end, we look at them at macro scale, basically in concrete to see uh, what properties they give us. This property can be super plasticizing effects. It can be air training effects, uh, any other type of uh, admixture property. I'm specifically talking about the two uh, first layers, the molecular and physiochemical properties in this talk. Uh, OK, these are some of the materials that we use. We use different proteins. Uh, we use uh, some chemicals, STS, urea, and lignin, to change the chemical structure of these proteins, basically to engineer them to give us the properties that we want. And we did uh, a set of different tests, uh, uh, starting with physiochemical properties like self-ascension, size, and charge of these molecules, to forming properties, to 
characterizing their 3D structure using X-ray tomography, uh, all the way to chemical characterization and free star testing. Uh, it is important that we look at the full uh, spectrum of tests because these are not, these have, these have not been studied that uh, much. Uh, but again, I'm going to only focus on this uh, part. Okay, let's start with this first important property, surface tension. Uh, surface tension is a very important property uh, in admixture science. Uh, basically, water has around 72 millinewton per meter uh, of surface tension, which is the force uh, between uh, water molecules. And this force uh, prevents water from forming or forming any bubbles, uh, or if they do, they disappear in milliseconds. If you want to have foams, uh, for example, with a soap, you have to decrease the surface tension. And the more you do, usually, the more foaming uh, you get. Uh, and this is what uh, air entering admixtures do. They go on the surface of these bubbles and they reduce surface tension and give it uh, foaming properties. Uh, here we're looking at uh, how different proteins are decreasing the foam, uh, sorry, decreasing the surface tension. In the first uh, two bars, you can see that uh, the green one is in water, the gray one is in pore solution. You can see that they have a surface tension around 72, which is surface tension of water. Then different proteins, SC, WP, IG, and so on, they're reducing the surface tension on their own. But the important one is the blue bar, which shows you the surface tension of the molecule that has been engineered with uh, one of these chemicals here, SDS. You see, uh, with SDS alone, we get to around 45 millinewtons per uh, meter of surface tension. The engineered proteins are going under uh, 30, around 37, 38. And this uh, gets increasingly hard to decrease surface tension as you go down. So from like 40 to 35, it's really hard, uh, and so on. So first of all, we are seeing that uh, our engineering of these chemicals, of these proteins, are working. The second properties, or the second set of property, is charge and size of these molecules. These are, again, very important in especially uh, superplasticizers, uh, and here, air training agents. It's, uh, basically, every time you want to interact with any interface, be it the uh, cement interface or the bubble interface, you have to look at these properties. First, let's look at the charge of these. Uh, so STS is an anionic uh, chemical. Proteins themselves are mostly uh, sm slightly anionic or neutral. Uh, but here, you are seeing the charge of these proteins with uh, different levels of modification through SDS. Uh, as you can see, with a very little amount of SDS, around five millimolar, we are getting to minus 40 uh, millivolts, uh, which shows how significant it is. The CP, which is a blue bar, is getting from minus uh, eight or nine to all the way to 30 something. So this shows how significant these changes are. Basically, what is happening here is that STS going on the protein 3D structure on the left, uh, it is giving it uh, some repulsive elect uh, electrostatic forces on coiling this uh, 3D structure and exposing the previously hidden parts of these proteins, uh, which can be anionic and give it this anionic force. And again, this is very important, for example, when you're looking at superplasticizers. The second part is the size of these uh, molecules. You are again seeing, you are again see that for hemoglobin and CP, we are starting at around 400 nanometer and ending up with uh, around like 40, 50 nanometer in size for hemoglobin, which is very, very significant change in size. Uh, this is because proteins usually are very small, again, uh, around like a few nanometers, but they can form complexes and aggregates as you can see on the right. Uh, what SCS or other chemicals here do is they go in these uh, microstructures, they change, they uh, break down these chains into smaller pieces. Uh, okay, so these properties are important in our bubble or forming stability because what you want is when you are mixing concrete with area and training agents, you want uh, some 
bubbles to form, and you want these bubbles to be small and remain small and uh, not join together. If they join, like the image on the left, uh, what you end up is with like large bubbles and finally large voids in the concrete, which is really not what you want. Uh, you see a comparison between two of our proteins, the one on the top and the one on the bottom, where like one of them has uh, uh, high stability albumin and one of them has low stability. Uh, and this is the 10 minute forming uh, volume for some of these proteins that have been modified with different chemicals here, STS. Uh, I want you to look at the red bar and the blue bar. Red bar is protein only in pore solution. The blue bar is the protein that have been modified. As you can see, some of them are dropping in foaming uh, stability. Uh, not all our proteins are gonna be improved if you change their molecular structure, so we have to understand the underlying mechanisms, and this uh, modification has to be done um, when we know the full picture. But some of the proteins, specifically hemoglobin and albumin at the end, are showing a significant increase in stability. Uh, okay, at the end, what we want is to take these uh, proteins, engineered proteins, put them in concrete, and see the uh, structures that uh, they produce, and we do that with X-ray tomography. Here you can see, a, you see a comparison between different uh, samples, the control, and the one modified with hemoglobin. Uh, this is like a good summary of the air entraining effect. Uh, first we start with cement paste, which has around 1% porosity. If we use only one of these chemicals, for example, SCS here, and I chose SCS because it gives the highest porosity on its own, uh, we see a porosity around 3%. With only protein, we get around 10, 11%. But when we mix these two, if they were acting alone, you would expect something around like 14%, right? 10 plus, plus 3 or 4. But what you get is 23%. And with some of them, they go above 30, which shows the synergistic effect that I put in the title. Basically, they are working together and they're enhancing side. They're all, uh, to uh, each other's uh, properties. And as you can see, some of these voids are very small, which show, which is very important because you just you don't want to just increase the porosity, you want to keep the uh, void sizes as small as possible and as well dispersed as possible. Um, on the top you see control with only these chemicals, which they give low porosity, high uh, uh, separation or spacing, and uh, high void sizes, which is not good. On the bottom you see the contrary proteins, hemoglobin in this case, modified with different Chemicals is giving you very high porosity, very small void sizes, and very well spacing. And it is important, and here you see the effect of protein concentration. Uh, you see we got to per, uh, porosities as high as 32%. Uh, and it is important to note here that in a real world uh, scenario, you don't want 30% porosity, right? You want, again, like 4 to 7% porosity. But because we're at this, uh, chemical design stage, we want to get as more efficiency as we can, right? Then uh, in the uh, practical cases, we can lower this uh, porosity to uh, that range. Uh, we are doing and we have done other studies that I don't have time here to uh, go over. Uh, hopefully in another session we can talk about them, but it is important to see how these proteins absorb on cement particles, how they change the hydrophobicity of the cement matrix, how they change the flowability for superplasticizing effect, uh, or sorptivity, or free stop performance, and so on. And uh, the second paper on these projects is under review. Hopefully, there will be more publications next year, uh, if you want to look it up. Uh, this project is supported by a couple of NSF uh, grants that you see here. And thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Later.